Okay, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Good morning, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, now is the time to start the first session, a plenary session. Uh, I'm very excited uh, to welcome the excellent, very excellent panelists. Uh, Minister Kono, welcome to the panel. Uh, also, my maybe uh, he should be a little bit nervous between uh, because uh, the, that session has just started. Uh, next week, uh, he's going to attend the very attention-grabbing uh, budget committee. So you should be a little bit careful for your remarks. At the same time, at the same time, many people are expecting your corner style, very bold and provocative remarks. Okay, and uh, anyway, he will speak later. And also today, we have uh, excellent panelists uh, from online, uh, as was uh, introduced by moderator uh, Dr. Michael Austin. Uh, he's an Asian uh, geopolitics specialist, as you know. And Professor Mary Tugeno, uh, she's an international trade and uh, economic law specialist. And uh, Dr. Jane Harmon, uh, she used to be a uh, U.S. representative, and she had a lot of experience in policy making, I believe. Uh, so anyway, uh, today's uh, topic is uh, uh, to discuss the uh, grand design of the post-COVID world. Uh, of course, this is a very difficult task. We have a lot of problems in uh, at this moment. For example, U.S.-China uh, confrontation and, of course, the Russian invasion to Ukraine and the fragmentation in each society, as you know, and the growing risks at the global economy, etc., etc. Under such circumstances, concurrently, COVID-19 crisis uh, overspread the world. Uh, so, anyway, in the very first round of this session, I would like each panelist to speak how you see the current situation of the global economy and the politics. And beyond, uh, based upon that kind of free statement, I'd like to develop the discussions. I really welcome interactive discussions among panelists, of course, and later on, the floor will be open to your comments and uh, uh, questions. So first, uh, Austin Sun. Uh, could you kick off the uh, discussion, how you see the current situation of the global economy and the politics from the viewpoint of uh, Asian geopolitics specialist? Austin San, please. Yes, well, thank you very much, uh, Takenaka Sensei, and thank you to Hori Sensei uh, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm just sorry I'm not with you in person uh, in Tokyo, but hopefully next time. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on this panel with such distinguished co-panelists. and. Uh, I'm sure you're going to want to hear more from them than from me. So let me just make a few quick points about how I see the geopolitical environment uh, as it relates to Asia, but, but more broadly. Um, the first point I'd like to make, of course, if we're talking about the Roaring Twenties, uh, the 1920s, we have to remember that the 1920s led into the 1930s, which were not a great decade. And those led, of course, to the 1940s, which was an even worse decade. And I think there's reason to be worried because I think today we are in a period of the greatest geopolitical uncertainty since the 1930s. There's different types of uncertainty. We have global challenges to begin with. Obviously, we have uh, the challenges that Asia faces with a rising China and an increasingly aggressive China, which of course is going to open its 20th party Congress uh, just this week. Uh, we have, we don't need to mention Russia and Ukraine. Uh, we have North Korea, we have Iran, a whole host of global challenges that are getting worse, not getting better. But equally concerning, we have domestic challenges. We have a distrust of authority inside democratic nations. We have a divergence within our societies between elites and citizens. We have, therefore, more fragile domestic systems at the same time that we have geopolitical crises. Two other problems I think add to this uncertainty. The first is uh, a poverty of imagination. We don't seem to be able to solve our problems. We only seem to be waiting for the next crisis. And I think very dangerously, we can't seem, I think, to, um, to really accept that the international system could change fundamentally in ways that are not beneficial to our interests. We've been used to it for so long in ways that are beneficial to us that I think we really can't imagine that this system that we've known could go away. And our track record of prediction is extremely poor. 
uh, whether it's Russia invading Ukraine, inflation that we face now, uh, what would be next? The PRC invading Taiwan, Iran getting a bomb. Our prediction, of course, uh, my colleague Jane Harmon can talk a lot more about predictions and intelligence than I can, but our predictive track record's not very good. So let me then mention three other points uh, that lead to uh, that lead out of this issue of the uncertainty of our period. The first is that we are entering into, we are in a period, an era of systemic fragility. The system that we created, the institutions that we created are increasingly stressed, as I mentioned, unable to handle the crises we face. And at the same time, I would argue that we are facing a return of the nation state. Uh, there is, of course, cooperation that continues between democracies and between nations. We see it on Ukraine, but the interests of the nation state are growing, whether we see it over uh, ways to tackle inflation with the United States doing what it's doing, that's strengthening the dollar, raising interest rates, the EU beginning to crack over the question of subsidies and gas shortages that are coming this winter, other regional problems, the nation state, I think, is returning to the fore. Um, that leads to a third problem, which is that, or a third, uh, a third response, which is that I think the challenge going forward in these roaring 20s is not to pretend that the global system is adequate to deal with the crises we face or that it's going to be somehow self-correcting, that it will solve the problems, nor is it to fight the return of national interests and to fight the return of the nation state. If national interests return, there's nothing we can do to try and stop that. Instead, we need to, to attempt to create common ground. Um, we need to try to coordinate our responses. We need to promote the values that we share as democracies, but we have to recognize that the primary impetus may well be coming from national capitals and national capitals that are more responsive to their populations than they are to an international system. And that means that we cannot presume that we can enforce top-down solutions. That is simply not going to work. Let me conclude by making two observations. First, uh, the, this era of uncertainty and the problems of uh, international cooperation, as, as hard as it is in Europe, uh, I think will be as hard, if not harder, ultimately uh, in, in Asia. That's assuming, of course, Putin decides not to go nuclear in Europe. That would, of course, trump everything. Uh, but it is harder in Asia. It is harder because of the importance and the role uh, of China. It is harder because of the, um, uh, the uncertainty over uh, North Korea. The problem of strategic decoupling, the military tensions that are growing, and very importantly, the ideological and values disputes that we see throughout Asia. And so the last observation I have is that, and I think this is an important one, I, I'm in Washington, D.C., from the Washington DC perspective, I can't remember a time in the past 20 plus years where Japan has actually been more important to the discussions in Washington. The China dream in Washington is over. Everyone accepts that. We are groping towards a response. But because of that, the turn back towards valued allies like Japan is going to be ever more important to our policymakers and groups like G1 are going to be more important as we try to solve these problems. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Austin, Sam, for very stimulating remarks. You uh, stressed the importance of uh, international cooperation. Also, you're expecting a lot on the road of Japan. In that context, may I raise one specific question? Uh, next year, the Japan is going to chair the G7 summit. And as the chairman of the country, chairman, uh, what do you expect on Japan to roll this G1, G7 summit? Well, very briefly, I think the most important thing Japan can do is take its lead on trade issues, something that, of course, Merit Janow can talk about better than I can, but take the lead on things like CPTPP, uh, which, which is regional. It's obviously not G7. Uh, its lead now in political and security organizations such as uh, such as the Quad uh, and, of course, uh, the different types of ASEAN groups, and try to create consensus among the G7 how they're going to interact with these regional organizations. That's where I think we need to begin to knit together these common interests that ultimately flow from national interests. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much uh, for your kind comments. So now then, uh, Mr. Jano, Professor Jano, 
uh, uh, could you uh, continue the discussion? Uh, I'd like to hear your opinion, how you see the current situation with the economy and the politics. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. I, I too wish I were in person, uh, eager to get back to Japan. I do appreciate the positive uh, framing uh, and uh, the encouragement to uh, think about um, the 1920s and how we can drive a positive future. I think leaders in government, private sector NGOs need to think positively. It's difficult in the current environment with so much risk and uncertainty, but I appreciate your provocation. And let me offer a comment in three areas, maybe first around technology, second uh, around international cooperation, and, and third around internal conditions within countries. Um, on technologies, you know, the 20s was a dazzling ebullient period following a war and the Spanish flu. We saw 42% growth in the US economy and driven by technological change that started earlier, but that scaled in the 20s. And the biggest drivers were electricity and the uh, internal combustion uh, engine. And when I think about today, I think the digital revolution has been unfolding for some time, but it's now ubiquitous. And the importance of connectivity has really become ever more important during this pandemic. And the miracle of biomedical innovation has saved all of us and made such a contribution. And now IoT connecting devices are making life easier for the average person. In the 20s, we had refrigerators. Now we have refrigerators with wallets connected to stores and just you have to decide what you want. Um, you're also seeing automotive EV uh, autonomy accelerating, quantum AI, synthetic biology, uh, material sciences. So whether it's in the health area or the climate area uh, or many others, uh, I think we are in an extraordinary period of innovation that will help us lengthen our lives, bring inclusion into the economy. Now, all of these areas also have to be regulated. They can cause harms. They need to be incentivized for further investment. And they rely on open scientific borders and the flow of knowledge, I think, across borders. And that's what, to achieve their maximum potential. And that's where I think we turn to the geopolitical uh, conditions, uh, which are going to make that very difficult. Um, Look, uh, we're in a very dangerous period, um, I think, with uh, great escalation potential and implications for food, for energy, for nuclear from the conflict uh, in Europe. We're also in a very, I think, delicate period in US-China relations. You know, the 20s was not a period of global frameworks. It was a period of restriction. So where are we on global cooperation? Let me just say, I think we have global institutions, none of which are performing particularly well, all are underperforming to their potential, the UN, the WHO, WTO, Bretton Woods institutions, but all of which remain important and each has some play role to play. They couldn't be recreated today and I think we need to find areas where they can contribute and they are trying to do so. Uh, last week, I happened to be in Geneva speaking and I was uh, pleased to see that there's optimism a little bit coming out of the MC12 uh, ministerial meetings because of fisheries agreement, TRIPS waiver, WTO reform, and that this optimism needs to be seized to keep a baseline of openness and to move ahead where possible. And I think that's the conversation that's happening around the world It's implied by Michael Austin's remarks is to move ahead where possible among coalitions of the willing. And that conversation is occurring sectorally and it could lead to, I think, progress on digital trade. I'm interested what Mr. Kono has to say about that. 
on the digital economy, it could lead to new coalitions geopolitically. So I see a world of incremental progress and multi-level initiatives um, being inescapably part of the solution. Frameworks may be looser, like the COP framework is very loose, um, but that doesn't mean it can't uh, promote progress. The Indo-Pacific Trade Agreement looks different, less binding perhaps, but nonetheless can encourage positive action. CPTPP, I think was a very significant contribution. Now, when it comes to China, I remember Secretary Blinken saying early on, cooperate where we can, compete where we must. And I think that's a very good motto. But coming out of COVID-19 and the party Congress, the midterm elections, where is that cooperation going to occur? Uh, we, uh, you know, at the height of the Cold War, we were cooperating with the Soviet Union on smallpox. So the question I have is where can we, can we create the high walls with the small gardens that we are talking about, particularly when it comes to technology? And this is gonna have a lot of spillovers. Now, the third area is of course, of what's happening internally within countries. And uh, I agree also with the point that Michael Austin made a moment ago, is that countries are going to be focused on inward, on getting their own house in order to the extent that they can, um, and dealing with their own challenges. In the US, uh, uh, a lot of inequality, fragmentation, um, this is a huge challenge, but I never bet against the United States. I think we show resilience uh, in our economy. Uh, and um, again, uh, I don't wanna be a techno optimist or a democracy utopian uh, in response uh, to the very complex world we're in, but I think there are positive trends. In this, Japan, I agree, has a very significant role to play on the technology front, geopolitically, and if it can keep its economy even more vital. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jero uh, san Thank you. <clears throat> well, you read some, uh, although there are just many, many problems in the world, still we can have some optimistic view considering the, especially technology, and now in the process of the fourth industrial revolution, et cetera, maybe. And uh, let me raise a very specific question. Some economists in the United States are still insisting the possibility of secular stagnation. Well, current situation where we are at risk, and uh, this is the start of secular stagnation. Well, this is a very pessimistic view. How do you respond to this kind of uh, uh, opinion? Uh, well, Takenaka-san, you are the economist, and so I am not going to be an economist. Uh, I'm a, a, a political economist lawyer, uh, but, you know, look, we are in a very difficult moment. I think there's a lot of pent-up demand in our economy if we can control uh, inflation. Uh, we have still a, a high degree of savings. I think we can come through this. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, uh, let me respond if I have time. Maybe there is no time today, maybe. Uh, so thank you for waiting, uh, Haman san uh, Could you make a statement, please? Well, I'm in Ireland, and so it is one o'clock in the morning. So uh, please forgive me if I'm not very optimistic uh, about some of these issues. I am optimistic about one thing, and that is my friend Yoshi Hori, who has... Uh, held this conference for more than a decade. I was uh, there in person once and I have been virtually involved a number of times. But uh, Yoshi-san, thank you so much for all that you give uh, to, to me personally, but to the conversation in the world about these crucial issues. Uh, I am very grateful. Uh, on the topic, uh, let me make a few points that are perhaps different from the others, and, and, and maybe I'm doing this to be provocative, but I also think 
uh, we have to think a bit differently about some of these issues. Uh, the Roaring, Roaring Twenties 2.0, uh, I think <laughs> is, 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 a, is a nice, uh, nice to imagine, but, but impossible to achieve. First of all, roaring. Uh, the only roars we are hearing right now is our, our hot rhetoric from uh, China, from Russia, and from uh, President Biden in our own country. I don't think those roars are particularly useful. Uh, we had a president uh, over 100 years ago who said, "Walk, talk softly and carry a big stick. I think it is a time to talk more softly and think carefully about our strategies for the future. Uh, the future might not be very long term if Vladimir Putin carries through on his threat to use some form of nuclear weapon. And I think uh, his insistent shelling of the Zaporizhia nuclear plant is extremely worrisome. I don't think it's just a question of whether he would launch a, ta uh, a tactical nuke uh, at Ukraine. I think that is less likely. But a uh, so-called accident at Zaporizhia uh, could be enormously harmful uh, to obviously to uh, Ukraine, to Russia, to Europe, but also to the whole world. And you have a recent uh, experience in Japan with Fukushima, which started a different way, but nuclear accidents uh, are enormously costly. And I worry very much that that could be uh, in the short term, in the medium term, a game stopper. So that's one. Second point, after the Cold War ended, my country in, in, believed we won, we were the world's superpower, everybody wanted to be us. It was uh, a great miscalculation. Um, we did win, uh, but we overlooked the fact that uh, in the next period, there was a rise in terrorism, there was the rise of China, uh, and there was a rise of grievance in Russia all of which we are now seeing and having to deal with. So uh, the unipolar world never existed. Uh, geopolitics and history did not end. And where we are now is trying to find a different strategy forward. And here's where I might disagree with some of the panelists. Uh, I don't think uh, that necessarily that strategy will involve strong nation states making deals with each other. I, I would argue, and Michael, I think, disagrees with me, uh, that the nation state is actually weaker uh, than it has been or than it was 100 years ago. Leaders of countries have less room to maneuver. Think the United States. Uh, President Biden has a Congress that refuses to do what he wants. I spent uh, nine terms in the United States Congress when it worked better than now, but it didn't work very well then. So uh, leaders are, are, are hemmed in. The rise of populism also is creating a group of leaders who are very different from rational deal makers that we have uh, seen in the past. So I would argue that um, the nation state is in a, in a crisis point and, and not a strong uh, player. I would also argue there are several features of this world that were unimaginable 100 years ago. Uh, uh, and one of them is social media. Social media and the ability quickly to spread mis and disinformation is another game changer. And it is very hard to know anymore what the truth is, uh, given the rise of, of these tech giants. And oh, by the way, many of them are bigger than nation states. And it is possible to imagine a future, I'm not saying this is a good idea, but to imagine a future where they have a bigger role in, in what the world will look like and, and the shape of things, uh, then nation states will. And in fact, in some ways, they already do have a bigger role. The other thing that was unimaginable 100 years ago, although it was certainly present, is climate. And the fact that now we have literally states in the United States burning and drowning uh, and we had this devastation in Florida recently. I know the rest of the world is facing catastrophes too. I don't mean to talk, to denigrate what's going on in Pakistan or elsewhere, but I'm making the point that uh, my own country, which considers itself uh, you know, the, the, the strongest economy on earth is having major challenges uh, coping with these climate disasters. 
And the way forward will, it has to involve the whole world. Nation states by themselves can't do this and climate doesn't obey national borders. Uh, and I think uh, finally, um, I, I would make the point that, that um, thinking in terms of peace and prosperity, nice as it sounds, is, is probably um, wishful thinking, but almost impossible to achieve. I think that uh, right at the moment, uh, dealing with the emergency, which is uh, Russia's possible behavior uh, using or, or, or unleashing nuclear radiation, uh, is, is the thing we, we all must focus on. But I would say, secondly, uh, we should focus on how the regions of the world, and this was also mentioned, uh, how the regions of the world uh, can do a job that sadly the whole world can't seem to be doing. And the region that I would bet on, uh, okay, positive conclusion. The region that I would bet on is Asia. I think there is the biggest chance in Asia of countries figuring out a way forward and countries stepping up as Japan is uh, to take a leadership role in, in, in a, 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 a regional outcome uh, that is far better than what they have seen in, in what you have seen in recent decades. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Carmen Sam. You covered very wide range of important topics. I really appreciate that. One specific question. Well, uh, many Japanese, especially uh, political commentators, are worrying about uh, American politics. Well, uh, American democracy, maybe. Uh, economy is relatively good in the United States, but uh, there's some uh, confusion is uh, there in American uh, Washington DC politics. So, do you have any comment, short comment on this? <laughs> Uh, well, I don't have an optimistic comment on this. Um, our midterm elections are, are four weeks away. As someone who ran for office many times, I know that circumstances change uh, very quickly in politics. So four weeks is really four months, and it is hard to know uh, what voters will end up doing. Uh, that's, that's one point. Uh, Mitch McConnell, who is the U.S. Senate Majority Leader, spoke at a conference I attended a few days ago, and he said that the outcome for the Senate, in terms of who would have the majority, this is to quote him, is a coin toss. It's that close. That and uh, so, so we don't know, you know, it's really not gambling, but we really don't know. And the third point I'd make, though, which is very concerning to me, is for the first time in my lifetime, um, we have uh, serious forces in place in our states to contest the results of, elect of our election. And we may see it in these midterm elections. We'll surely see it in the 2024 presidential election. We'll have states, uh, <coughs> electors in states, uh, election officials saying that uh, the vote was fraudulent, that the count was inaccurate, and this will go on at a massive scale, even if the facts don't prove that. And that worries me on two levels. Number one, I want stable government in my own country. But number two, uh, others looking at America, they're starting to doubt our leadership because they doubt our politics. Well, thank you very much uh, uh, to, uh, answer, to answer the, uh, the difficult questions uh, in a short time. Well, Kono-san, thank you for waiting. Uh, by the way, some our uh, foreign panelists, uh, some are optimistic, some are pessimistic, uh, the body a little bit. But all three panelists raised the importance of middle power Japan. Based upon that opinion, I'd like to share your views on the global situation. Thank you. Well, this is uh, almost 10 o'clock in the morning in Tokyo, and uh, I'm pessimistic. Well, Japan's facing maybe four issues in the post-COVID. One is demography and the climate change, aggressive China, and the echo chamber in the social media. I think we need to invest in the next generation to solve this demography issue. And we need to invest in technology for climate change. And in order to do that, Japan need stronger economy and in order to make the 
strong economy in Japan, we need to invest or change in education, uh, especially not because I'm in charge of a digital agency, but I think we need to change education so we can bring in more digital technology in university or high school. Uh, the, it is not just to train the undergrad and the graduate students. I think it is very important for us to uh, do what do you call that reskilling for uh, the older generation. I think Japan's moving out of manufacturing to a new economy, and a large corporation has accessed employees uh, in the office. And they need to go through uh, reskilling uh, and uh, get uh, something new. And I think that's definitely important. And if we got a strong economy, I think we can invest in technology and we can invest in the next generation. And uh, as a middle power, Japan could play a bigger role. Well, aggressive China. China is increasing military spending 42-fold in the last 30 years, and uh, it is becoming a threat to international order. And uh, we don't have a global or international forum to uh, discuss issues. United Nations was China and Russia sitting in the Security Council with veto power is I wouldn't say useless, but very close to it. And I guess it is quite difficult to make changes to the current UN Charter. I think we need to have, we need to adopt UN Charter 2.0 to supersede existing uh, UN Charter. That's what the Americans did almost or more than 200 years ago. The first American constitution was so rigid they couldn't make amendment, so they simply adapted current UN constitution and throw away the original one. That's what we need to do for United Nations. I think we need to adapt UN Charter 2.0 and move on to UN 2.0. And uh, some people talked about TPP. TPP is not just a trade uh, agreement. It was supposed to be new rulemaking body for Indo-Pacific. Um, TPP might one day talk about security of the region, but since the United States left TPP, it's not functioning as it is supposed to be. So we are hoping one day United States will come back to TPP. And the uh, not only China, we have Russia and North Korea. Uh, the problem for Russia and North Korea is they're lowering threshold for nuclear weapons. Uh, for more than 70 years, uh, we haven't seen nuclear weapons being actively used in uh, on this planet. But I have a little doubt about those two countries. Lastly, uh, echo chamber in the social media. I think many democratic countries are being divided because I believe the ma role of mass media is shrinking and people more and more pay attention to social media. But uh, I mean, if you go through Facebook, Twitter or whatever, you only hear what you want to hear. I mean, look at those anti-vaccine fake news. It's so unscientific. But once you get in the loop, all you hear about is uh, bad news or fake news about the vaccine, and uh, you really believe vaccine is something bad. And that is the beginning of the division. And uh, it is happening in Japan as well. Well, it's still not as bad as the United States, but uh, many of the democratic nations are being divided politically because of that. I don't know what to do with this, but uh, that's something we all need to collectively overcome uh, the situation. So um, it's almost 10 and uh, I'm not as optimistic as some people. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Kuo san, for raising another important point of focusing, focusing some part of uh, Japan. Well, uh, you used to be the minister in charge of vaccination, so you faced a lot of uh, fake news. I'm also facing a lot of fake news on me, maybe. Uh, but anyway, in the second round, I used uh, much time for the first round discussion. Well, time is quite limited. So in the second round, I'd like each speaker to uh, to raise the, the, what's the most important uh, strategic agenda. Uh, you know, you all of you mentioned the importance of changing the international system, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, United Nations reform, IMF reform, and also CPTPT enforcement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Among them, what do you think is the most important uh, strategic agenda uh, regarding uh, how to strengthen the, how to change the international system? Uh, I, I'm I'm sorry, the time is quite limited. I'd like you each, uh, I'd like you. To speak only two minutes uh, to raise, uh, just to provoke the thoughts of the participant. Uh, please, Austin Sang, could you speak for two minutes on this point? Well, this is the answer that you could either give in thirty seconds or two hours because it's you know it's so complicated that I would say um, uh, I think I think you know nothing can be discussed or planned outside of context. And the context today is that we face perhaps the most dangerous security environment, at least since the Cold War, some are saying right now since 1962, 60th anniversary of Cuban Missile Crisis, and of course the highest inflation uh, in many of our countries since uh, for 40 years. So I think we have to scope down and we have to narrow down. We can't do everything we can't focus on things that are going to happen in 50 years or 25 years. We have to focus on the next week, the next six months, and the next year. That means security, 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 and econ, econ, econ. So that means making sure that Europe doesn't expand into a, a regional war, obviously that it doesn't go nuclear, obviously also South China Sea and Taiwan, and at the same time, get a handle on, on inflation and get our economies growing again. If we don't do that, honestly, I don't think it matters about climate change. You want to be provocative? It won't matter because we will be so impoverished, people will not care. They want food, they want heat, they want light, and they want safety for their kids. If you don't give them that, everything else is off the table. Focus on those two things. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, jane Osan, could you raise some points? Thank you. Um, I agree with what's been said, uh, but in that context, um, you know, I think it's very important that we keep our coalitions together. Um, uh, and uh, I'm still not used to calling Japan a middle power. I, I think of Japan as more than a middle power on some issues. Um, and, um, but I agree that. Um, getting through this crisis, and it will be a prolonged one. I don't see this as a short problem. It's a ongoing problem of uncertain duration um, on the security front. But keeping these coalitions going, particularly with the United States and Japan, Europe, and others in a world where a number of countries, including Japan, have deep and ongoing ties with China. So managing the US-China, the China's relations, I think is one of the most important issues uh, facing the world as well. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we understand that the uh, General Assembly of the Communist Party of China has just started. And uh, maybe President Xi Jinping will be reelected, but beyond that, what will happen? Yes, we have to be very careful on that. Uh, Haman Song, please. As I've been thinking about this, um, it, it occurs to me that something I didn't say, and maybe I'll just put this out as the challenge, is that if we try to do everything Michael just said, and I agree with all of it, um, we need something in addition that's different, and that is a positive vision of, of what the potential is for democracies around the world. You live in a democracy. We live in a, in a fragile democracy at the moment. Um, but uh, this this vision of democratic values and 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 the the 
the things that uh, Ronald Reagan, our president, once said, the shining city on a hill, what that could mean uh, for the world is something we have to uh, uh, pay more attention to. Because as we stop immediate, <laughs> the, the immediate threat of nuclear weapons, and as we build the stronger regional alliances, and as we work on our uh, economies, all of which need work, um, we have to project together, and I think we can, uh, what the value is of, of uh, democratic governance. And if we can do that, then I think, once we get through the immediate problems, uh, we will have a much better chance uh, to bring the world along. And no one has mentioned the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, clearly, uh, we did not pay enough attention to Africa and Latin America uh, uh, after, after World War II, and certainly after the Cold War. And these are, are regions that need our investment and our attention, and we ignore them at our peril. So a, a, a positive vision, uh, reaching for the whole world to share that vision, I think will get us farther fastest. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we have been living in the so-called liberal world order, democracy, the rule of the law, and uh, globalization, multi-state, uh, uh, multi uh, multi-country system of world. Uh, such and such, but we have to keep the merit of this kind of liberal world order. Uh, but now we are uh, facing this uh, kind of a challenge. So Kono-san, could you raise some point? Thank you. When I was a foreign minister, I was so used to asking, what can we do to help your economy to my counterpart? But ever since I became digital minister, they asked me, what can we do to help Japan's digital transformation? Thank you very much. So I think we need to struggle to remain as a middle power, and that's what I'm afraid of. Well, looking at the situation in Ukraine or looking at the situation in Taiwan, we know that no country can defend themselves you know, alone, maybe except the U.S. and China. So it is important for us to get into some kind of framework of collective defense uh, will help you, but you help me when we are in trouble. The issue is more and more democratic countries are not willing to get involved in the kinetic warfare because uh, the government uh, cannot afford to uh, lose people. So it is very important to use economy as the as a weapon so how we can build a global supply chain just in case we can do more economic sanction on some aggressors so how we can build a global supply chain or rebuild a global supply chain among the like-minded country and get more economy into our side I think that may be a very uh, focus point for new strategy. Well, thank you very much, all panelists. So now is the time uh, for you. The floor is open to your comments and discussions. Uh, uh, please uh, read the very short question uh, and please identify who you are asking. You asking. Please identify your name and etc. Yes, go ahead, please. Um, uh, Robert Ward, double I, double S. Um, the panel uh, rightly talks about the rise of the uh, nation state um, and was pessimistic, I think, with, with reason. Um, but it, some existing international organizations have also found new strategic purpose, particularly since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I'm thinking about NATO, which is expanding, and of course the EU, which is becoming more uh, geopolitical. Also, the emergence of new groupings uh, to reflect changing strategic needs, such as the Quad, CPTPP, but also AUKUS, others. My question is, could the panel please comment a bit more about what the rise of the nation state means for how international cooperation might evolve? Uh, who are you asking, asking to anyone? Panel, all panel, well, the time is limited, so anyone from the panel? Well, I, I would just say, yeah, Austin, please. Austin, please. Austin, please. I would just say very briefly, it's an excellent question. And, and I would say that because we have now a two generation uh, tradition and, and worldview that 
we cooperate internationally through these groups, our initial uh, response rightly is, is to look to do that, right? So we, we maybe create new ones like Quad or AUKUS, uh, or as you say, we revitalize old ones like NATO. But we, mm -hmm. we, we've done that in an environment that, was, that still was largely benign. My, my fear is that these are very fragile institutions. Look at the problems we have with Quad today. Uh, and I believe very strongly, by the way, that Japan should be invited into the AUKUS grouping. I think it should be JAUKUS, not just AUKUS, uh, for, for reasons I won't go into. But when we actually face the danger of, uh, of, of having to respond kinetically, of, of going beyond what's easy, you know, giving aid or maybe even giving weapons, then these are, these are not institutions that have been tested. And that's, that's why I worry about their fragility. And it's much easier to revert back to, and I hope I can continue a debate uh, with Jane at some point, because I agree with her about the fragility of the nation state, but I don't think that makes it any less important. That's what makes them so, uh, so ultimately where we go back to, they control borders, they control militaries. No, you know, no corporation does that. There are irreducible functions that the nation state has that do not change or have not changed yet. And therefore it is always easy to revert to it when you see that the path forward within these institutions is extremely risky. And you're not, especially as the United States, 100% sure how much your partners are willing to bring to the table. Well, thank you very much. Uh, considering the time constraints, I'd like to uh, accept the, the next question. Harsan, please. Yes, uh, this is Yoshi Hollywood Globus. I may be hearing pessimistic views and I'm a very positive person in nature. Do you see any kind of like optimistic scenario and what kind of measures should be taken as leaders? Anyone? Anyone? Maybe, maybe Jane or Ben. Talos. Merit? Merit? Are you ready to respond? Well, yeah, I think uh, if I may say, um, I find there are lots of reasons for optimism, but they're not geopolitical or security related. Uh, you know, I think, um, you know, reference was made to the role of corporations. Uh, you know, there, I think, uh, I think there are new coalitions being formed between corporations and governments uh, that are delivering uh, uh, on a number of challenges that we face in the world, including with NGOs, but not at the scale that we need, uh, but creating opportunities around financial inclusion, around poverty alleviation, hopefully potentially around climate. Um, so I think there are areas you can point to where there are new, we often use the word multi-stakeholder, it's not that self-explanatory, but where there are different kinds of coalitions being formed, private, public, governmental, that are advancing issues in significant ways not necessarily at the scale or dealing with these security issues, but nevertheless, they're very important and they're the way progress will advance, in my view, not unilaterally by governments alone. Yeah, that, on, Yoshi, on, that, that, oh, sorry, that was the point, I guess, not, not very articulately that I made initially was to say, and, and it does relate to the nation state, that groupings, of, of, of companies, NGOs, uh, populist movements, uh, in addition to some government functions will be the way uh, we go forward in a, in a multi, multi, multi-polar world. There won't just be one grouping. And I think that, I, 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 I do agree, that is, that is a cause for optimism because just think about um, how we develop these drugs uh, uh, to combat uh, COVID-19. Uh, that was a basically a private sector effort driven by some government investment on the front end. This project Warp Speed, the, an initiative of, of President Trump, former President Trump, and uh, we will not uh, solve a lot of our problems without having other groups, uh, 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 corporations, and and others involved. And, and and final point that I was trying to make also is we do have to have a positive vision of the world we want. 
Uh, it's not just a world where we balance all these interests. And I, you know, I, I think realism is not adequate for the world we want. Some idealism is also necessary. Well, thank you very much. A uh, kind of uh, multi-stakeholder uh, something system is needed. So the conclusion, if any, will be we need cautious optimism, maybe. Cautious optimism as a moderator, maybe. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to answer another question. If you have comment and question, yes, over here, please. I have a question for Kono san. Um, I have a question for Kono san. Um, in your talk, you talk about the uh, collective defense. So, regarding that point, um, which country? Do you think that is a potential candidate, considering the neighbor of Japan is like Russia, China, North Korea is not so, how am I going to say, it's not an ideal um, candidate for that part? Could you repeat your question? What a candidate for what? Deep defense. For the defense. Please be careful, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm not talking about the particular countries. I think all the like-minded country uh, need to defend the common values like democracy, uh, human rights, rule of law. So Japan need to be uh, one of it to defend the common value. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and also as a very fi final study, I'd like to accept one question from online. Right, so we have one question online, and this is not really directed at anyone, so I think panel again. And the question is, what about the undemocratic nature of grouping of corporations working to solve problems rather than it being done by democratic processes? How is this going to solve the increasing societal rifts within democratic nations? Anyone from the panel? And the democratic nations, what, what's the point, maybe? Um, so the last part goes, how is this going to solve the increasing societal rifts within democratic nations? So the grouping of corporations working to solve problems rather than it being done by a democratic process. Okay, anyone? Difficult questions there. Anyone? Well, uh, just uh, don't want to leave any question unanswered. Let me say that, you know, to see that there is a role for corporations working with governments and NGOs is not to say that we can rely on corporations to solve all societal issues and that they can't create problems of their own. So it's a question of what areas are amenable to what kinds of actions by what actors and I, I just don't want to leave the impression uh, from our conversation that we're saying the answer lies only in corporations. It lies selectively in collaborations, uh, but it's, it is ultimately up to governments to regulate uh, harms. Yes, but just to add to that, a term we use in, in, the, in the US is public-private partnerships. And certainly on many issues, especially technology related, the private sector brings much more to the table than the government. And I agree that sometimes there needs to be regulation, but I think very often uh, government can benefit just from uh, uh, the partnership with the, pub with the private sector and the ability to, to get uh, the kind of help that's necessary uh, to solve big problems, whether they are pandemics or climate or uh, you know, or, or economic issues. Well, thank you very, very much for already very stimulating questions uh, from the uh, floor. Uh, so the time is quite limited. So very finally, I'd like to ask Kono-san uh, to make a final statement uh, based upon uh, these discussions. Well, thank you very much. Well, we have suffered for last two, three years from COVID, and now COVID is getting not over, but I think we need to live with it. So we are opening up the country. Japan's opening up finally tomorrow, and I hope it will continue. 
and uh, Japan is back to the international order. So there's a lot of things Japan could make contribution to, and uh, hope we can do that. And uh, Japanese companies are uh, now back to the global economy, and uh, they could work with a uh, foreign company to solve the global issue as well. So Japan is back, and uh, although we sort of sound pessimistic, there's always another day, and uh, we want to look up and be more optimistic. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very, very much. Uh, we discussed a very uh, complicated issues of, of happening in the global society. And the purpose of this session is just to provoke your thought. Uh, in the breakout session, uh, it have a lot of discussions. Uh, but anyway, I really hope this uh, panelist uh, provoke your thought. Well, we had some analogy between the current situation and the situation in the 1920s. 1920s, we, we experienced a lot, as was mentioned by Horisan, uh, because toward the end, the end of this uh, 20s, we had Great Depression. And this is a very pessimistic one. At the same time, in that process in the 20s, very new industry that happened in Japan. In 1920s, for the first time, Japanese automaker created the automobile. This is the first time uh, uh, that, that Japan created to produce the automobile. And also, uh, at that time, uh, the new type of urban development uh, happened. So new lifestyle was proposed under the crisis. This is an important lesson from 1920. We should be uh, always uh, cautious. We should have a cautious optimism. Uh, very finally, please raise big hands to all panelists. Thank you very, very much. Thank <laughs> you.